The next speaker is Marta Maria. Okay, be- before I start, I just want to thank the organizer for the organization of these three days of conference, which have been very nice. And um, with this talk, now I will discuss a test of a, a hypothesis for fundamental physics. And this is some, uh, some of the recent work I've been done uh, in collaboration with these people here. So uh, from, from the left, we have Alessio Belenchia, who was a postdoc in our research group in Belfast, and now is in Tübingen. And um, then there is Stefano, Professor Stefano Pirandola from the University of York. And then on the right side, uh, there is my supervisor, uh, Professor Mauro Paternostro. And uh, if you want to know more, of course, you can ask me questions, but there is also a preprint on the, on the archive. Uh, okay, this is the outline uh, of, the, of the presentation. So I will, uh, I will introduce uh, collapse models uh, because these are some of the theories uh, that are m- m- the, m- some of the most studied alternatives to quantum mechanics. And uh, I will try to describe as well um, the system we use to study those models. So basically, uh, optomechanical cavities are usually very suitable platform to test those models. And uh, the third point of this talk is a description of uh, the test of hypothesis we performed. So basically, when you want to make a strong claim about uh, a theory, about uh, anything, you can use uh, uh, an hypothesis testing. And we use it to infer with a high level of confidence that there are some collapse models acting on uh, optomechanical systems. And eventually, I will show you some of the results we, we got. So, um, OK, for those of you who might not be familiar with collapse models, I will just give you a brief introduction on them. So they, uh, the, these kind of models uh, try to address some of the fundamental questions which uh, uh, still don't have an answer. Uh, for example, the incompatibility between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, uh, which is not uh, only mathematical, but also conceptual, and uh, the very well-known measurement problems. The solution that they propose is, the, is an objective modification of the standard quantum theory to restore macroism at, at large scale. The first model was proposed by Girardi, Rimini, and Weber. And basically, the key assumption of those models uh, is that uh, the wave function of your system is uh, something real. And uh, um, is something that collapses randomly in space. So this is a kind of assumption that the coherence happen in, uh, in space. And um, in that way, you're able to uh, prevent a, um, a macroscopic superposition at large scale, but you're still able to recover like uh, quantum mechanics for, for, for small systems. They introduce some new parameters which are uh, lambda, and this is the collapse rate, so the, the rate at which the collapse happen, which now is a spontaneous process and is not related to, to a measurement. And then there is the coherence length, uh, which is the, um, the minimum length above which uh, all the superposition are suppressed. A key feature of these uh, models uh, is the amplification mechanism. And these basically describe how you can keep both quantum and classical mechanics together. So when uh, uh, the, um, this, this says that uh, basically the rate at which the collapse happens is proportional to the number of particles uh, uh, you have in your, in your system. So if you're describing, uh, like for example, only, only a particle, let's say the n is equal to one, you will have a rate for the collapse, which is very low. That means that the natural collapse will happen in a, in a time scale which is very high. So in, a, in such a long time that you will never experience uh, the natural um, collapse of this particle. But on the other hand, this allows you to, to see a superposition of small objects. If you, if you go higher in the number of particles of your system, so let's say you want to describe an object uh, which is made of a number of particles larger than the Avogadro's number, then the wave function of the whole object will have a rate which is very high. 
So for example, uh, 10 to the power seven seconds to the minus one. What does it, that mean? Uh, it means that the wave function will collapse so rapidly, so rapidly that your object will always be localized in space. And in that way, you prevent it to have a special superposition, a special macroscopic superposition. So um, those are phenomenological models, uh, uh, however. So there is actually no fixed values for those parameters. There are some guesses. For example, Gerardi and Rimini Weber provided these values for lambda according to these uh, values of the coherence length. And then later, Hadler proposed another values. But still, these, these are just guess. But they are important models to, to study because uh, they can also be tested experimentally. And there are two ways of testing them. So there are some interferometric ex experiments and there are non-interferometric ones which uh, rely on uh, like a side effect that assuming a collapse models uh, uh, can, can show on a system. Um, okay, so in this talk, I will focus only on one of those models. And in particular, we will discuss the continuous spontaneous localization model. In these models, um, it has been provided a modification of the Schrodinger equation. And this modification has to be nonlinear, first of all, and then stochastic. As we can see here, the first term is just the standard Schrodinger term, but there are two extra terms which provide the nonlinearity of the equation. And these two terms are proportional to the localization strength, which is uh, proportional uh, to, the, to the rate of collapse, lambda. So basically we can see from this equation that uh, uh, when we have a high rate, so for example, for a macroscopic object, these two terms uh, are kind of relevant. And you have a nonlinear equation, so you, you, you can describe your macroscopic objects um, without uh, uh, predicting any superposition of states. But on the other hand, when this, uh, this, localiz this factor here is very small because it's proportional to the rate, so for, for small scale systems, let's say, these two terms becomes negligible. And you basically recover all the predictions and the results that you, that you have from quantum mechanics. So um, there are two new, new elements in this equation. One is the collapse operator. So this is a jump operator. And according to the choice, the form of this operator, you can have different models. And then there is the, um, this uh, DWT, which describes just a linear process, so a stochastic process. And it is linked with, uh, with the presence of a, or, of a white noise. OK. Now, uh, this is the system uh, we, we studied. So uh, basically, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a combination of two cavities. Uh, one of the two is embedded with a mechanical mirror. And the to describe the system is given uh, here in this part below. So basically, uh, there is just the, 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 the Hamiltonian for the two cavity modes, the light field inside the two cavities, and uh, uh, the, mechanical, uh, the mechanical mirror, which can be described as a quantum harmonic oscillator. And then the last part is the interaction between the light and the mirror. And this is the initial, the initial system. So, uh, at the beginning, we prepare our system. So the initial state is chosen to be the steady state that is reached when we only pump some coherent light into the two cavities. And this is represented by the red shaded area here. So we, we pumped coherent light in both the two cavities with the system to reach the equilibrium. And this has been chosen as the initial state for the subsequent dynamics. Um, the, the dynamics is Gaussian. So basically, uh, the initial state are Gaussian, and the dynamics will preserve the Gaussianity for the whole time. And then we inject two extra mode fields. So these green lights here are input mode one and input mode two, which, which are added, and they will drive the dynamic of our system. And uh, so they are directed into the two cavities. We let them to interact with the cavities and the mechanical mode, and then um, and then the, the, the output mode will be collected again. Of course, there is a freedom of choice of the kind of uh, 
input modes, we can decide because we can have some sort of initial correlation. So for example, entangled uh, light beams, or we can have them independent. And according to the choice of the initial input mode, we will have different results. And I will discuss about this uh, in, in a while. So uh, after we, uh, the, the two output modes are recollected again, we, mm, we can perform a measurement. And also here we can have like a, a quantum measurements or a classical one. So now how can we include the effect of the uh, collapse on the dynamic of this system? Basically, uh, the, the dynamics is described by this Lyapunov-like equation in terms of second momenta, uh, where sigma is the covariance matrix, A is just a coefficient matrix, and D is the diffusion matrix. And then um, the CSL comes into play here in, uh, in this part here, because it's like a, an extra dissipative effect. So basically, in this diffusion matrix, we have two diagonal blocks, uh, two blocks on the, on the diagonal. Uh, one is the one responsible for the input modes we are injecting, the extra noise fields. And the other one is the uh, matrix describing uh, noises affecting the mechanical mirror. And it's here that we have to include the CSL effect. How? Basically, uh, your mirror will experience uh, like, a, um, like an extra heating. This is the covariance matrix for the mechanical mirror. And uh, the mirror is in contact with, a, with an environment with a fixed temperature T. So basically, this contribution uh, comes from uh, some Brownian motion. And this delta is the, uh, the contribution coming from assuming that there is a, a collapse affecting the mechanical resonator. So you can actually describe these terms, uh, redefining uh, an effective number of phonons uh, for uh, an effective temperature T given by the two contributions. So the environmental one and a fictitious temperature coming from the CSL effect. And now you want to, I mean, when you, when you explore the dynamic of the system, uh, you want to claim uh, with some confidence uh, that there is or there is not a collapse going on here. How do you do that? You have a useful tool, uh, which is the test of hypothesis, that will allow you to, to make strong claim. So in order to do that, the first step is to define the two hypotheses. The two hypotheses are in general uh, described in terms of H0 and uh, H1. Uh, H0 is the null hypothesis, is the um, historically like the, the commonly assumed to be true. And in our case, uh, we can identify this hypothesis um, with the channel described by a simple open dynamics. So this epsilon zero. The alternative hypothesis on the other end uh, is the new effect. So in, in our case, it's the channel that will mm, consider um, the, the effect coming from uh, an extra dissipative mechanism, which is the, the collapse model. And this is epsilon one. The two channels, uh, are characterized by some parameters, which we choose to be this uh, delta here. So this is zero when there is no collapse going on. This is different than zero when there is the, the collapse. And of course, there will be, for the two dynamics, uh, two different uh, variances associated. So one will be sigma zero square and the other one sigma one square. Um, but you have to decide which one of the two hypotheses is actually, uh, is actually true. So you have your system, but you don't know which, uh, which is the dynamic that the system is experiencing. And uh, so you, you need like, a, um, you need a criterion above which to make your decision. And this is given by this level of significance. So alpha is, the, um, is, some, is somehow the maximum error you will allow when you will accept or reject either one or the other hypothesis. And this level of significance is defined as the probability of obtaining a test statistic larger than a certain critical value. This critical value is like the threshold. So basically, when, in theory, when you perform an experiment, you will collect some data. You will compute a test statistic from the experiments, and this is, will be the, the t-star. Then you compare this t-star with the critical value. If this is bigger than your critical value, then you will reject your null hypothesis. Why? Because that means 
that the probability of obtaining another test statistic larger than the one you got from the experiment is actually smaller than the level of significance alpha. And you can see in the picture, like, uh, uh, it's just like uh, the probability correspond to the area below the curve. So in that case, it will be more likely that, uh, uh, that your data belong to a statistical distribution that uh, it is not the one assumed in the null hypothesis. So, and if you reject the null hypothesis in, in the scenario in which you have only a dichotomic, uh, um, uh, only a dichotomic case, you will accept H1. The other end is when uh, your test statistic from the experiment is smaller than the critical value. So in that case, you will accept H0. So in that case, you can make your decision either to uh, accept or reject the null hypothesis. But as I mentioned here, when you set the level of significance, there is still a probability of making an error. And uh, this probability is what we studied. So basically, we can uh, describe the total error probability of the sum of two kind of probabilities. Type one correspond to the error that we commit when we uh, when we accept the alternative hypothesis, but actually it's the null hypothesis that it is it is true, and this corresponds to the level of significance. The type two error probabilities is the the other way around. So the alternative hypothesis is the one uh, uh, that's true one, but uh, we are actually uh, accepting the null hypothesis. We computed the, this error probability for our system, and we see here that it it depends only on the uh, it, it depends on the two variances for the two channels. So just a reminder, uh, we have uh, hypothesis the null hypothesis uh, described by uh, describing the channel where there is no CSL, and uh, Alternative hypothesis is the one described by describing a CSL effect. So uh, we compared in our work uh, two different protocols. So as I mentioned, when I described the system, um, there um, uh, there are some there is some freedom in the in the choice, for example, of the resource we can do. And a classical protocol, for example, will provide will. Um, uh, we'll consider that we consider um, um, it, it, we decide as a resource two independent thermal states. So uh, the covariance matrix is like a diagonal, block diagonal, and it depends just on the uh, thermal number of photons that we have in the in the two laser beam and one and then two. Uh, also, the measurement we decide to do is just a, a local measurement. So the two output fields. Uh, will be directly measured. And this is what we define a classical protocol. On the other hand, we can decide uh, like uh, to set some initial correlation of the two modes. And for example, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, decide like um, two mode squid states. In that case, um, um, the covariance matrix is defined in terms of the squeezing, uh, the squeezing parameter R and the squeezing angle phi. And the measurement we perform is also a contour measurement. So the two output modes will be recombined together and mixed together through, for example, a beam splitter before we perform a measurement of the um, EPR um, quadrators, which are the, the einstein podolsky rosen quadrature. So um, what, what is the goal now? The goal is to compare the two protocols. So from the two approach, we can derive the variances and we can uh, compute the error probabilities. And uh, what we want to com what we want to um, uh, to know is that uh, if there is like uh, one of the two protocol that works better than other. So in particular, if the quantum resource can outperform the classical one. And the answer to that question is yes. And I will show you some results now. But in order to um, to say uh, that there is an advantage in using a quantum protocol, we need to define this other quantity, which is a classical bound. And uh, this is the minimal, the minimum error probability that can be achieving, achieving using any classical resource. And that depend, depends just on the fidelity of the output states with CSL and without CSL. So this bound is easily to, co to compute. 
and it tells you that this is the minimum error that you can commit with any classical resource. So in the plot here, you can see that uh, uh, the, um, the classical bound is the dashed line and the solid lines represent the, the classical error probabilities. And this is always greater than the bound, of course, as expected. Moreover, we see that the two colors describe an increasing number of photons we inject in the two cavities. So when we increase the number of photons, uh, actually we have a worse error probabilities a higher error probabilities, this means a worse discrimination of the two channels. And these are some of the uh, results. So uh, we plot the quantum error probabilities and the classical bound, and we compare them because uh, if there is a violation of the classical bound, that means that we actually have a better protocol, the quantum one, um, that will give you a lower error probability. And we explore the parameters, um, so the, the number of photons we injected into the cavities, the squeezing angle, and the number of experiments you repeat. Uh, in this plot, for example, we see that uh, mm, we varied the, the angle of squeezing. And for some values of this angle, there is actually a violation of the bound. And this is the, the main result, because for some choice of parameters, the quantum protocol outperform any classical strategy. Uh, we also uh, showed that uh, if we uh, vary other parameters, so for example, we increase n, which is the number of the experiments, um, the violation of the bound is still there. And of course, like uh, when you increase the number of experiments, uh, your statistics gets better. So you will get uh, a lower uh, error probabilities and a lower classical bound. Just for the sake of completeness, we decide to have a look at what happens when we when we plot uh, when we mix the, the resource and the, the measurement. So we have quantum resource, uh, quant uh, quantum resource and classical measurements, and the other way around. And these are the the, the curve plotted here. The green and the blue one is the mix of strategies. But in these two cases, like uh, uh, there is no advantage, so this is not not really useful. So basically, we checked that uh, these results uh, hold for, uh, for other choice of the uh, collapse parameter. Um, so in, in that plot, we have a variation of this parameter. And on the x-axis, we have the time. And basically, we plotted the quantum advantage. And we saw that the, this is still, uh, is still there. So there is a quantum advantage, even when we vary the, um, the values of the CSL parameters. So the, the result is, is general. And yeah, this is the, the conclusion of the, of the talk. So uh, the two main results is that uh, we found a, a, a protocol in which quantum resource outperform a classical uh, scheme, any classical scheme for some choices of parameters in the discrimination of two channels encoding the presence or the absence of the collapse. And we show that these results uh, also hold for, um, for a, different, a different range of values of the CSL parameters. And uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. So now it's time for questions. I don't understand one thing. You started uh, talking about the collapse models and I don't really see how this, is, uh, this was related to the hypothesis testing. So did you perform an experiment testing for these collapse models or no? No, we did, we did not do a, um, an experiment. We just studied the, the error probabilities. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, basically, um, the, the collapse models like are, are the theory we want to, we want to test the theoretically. And uh, hypothesis testing is, is useful because it provides you the tools to, to study the error probability. So we wanted to, to have a look at the error probabilities and we compare the error probabilities for the quantum case and the uh, classical one. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you want to do, for example, uh, an experiment, um, you, you can do it and then you can form a proper test of hypothesis and it's better to use like a quantum, quantum resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, we, we have another question from Yarek. So one hypothesis is that CSL happens, right? Uh, yes. 
one one is like uh, um, basically one is the absence of CSL, and the alternative one is the the new effect. So um, the presence of a collapse effect on on your system, on the dynamic of the system. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you again.